If you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be starting at verse 23. Like I was just sharing there in the opening, this is the, he, Paul kind of wraps up his thought here that he's shared in chapter 8, 9, and 10. His whole thought here mm -hmm. is, like he starts off in the first verse, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He's saying, mm -hmm. using three chapters to explain to us that mm -hmm. for you to say, I have liberty to do so-and-so is not the point. He's saying, it's not all helpful. What your point should be is how you can help others. Uh, like it says before the verse starts here, it says, do all things to glory God, all things to the glory of God. And sometimes we get caught up in the things that we can do or that we shouldn't do or whatever, rather than focusing on building up a brother or a sister and doing all things to glorify God. So let's read those verses, starting verse 23. We'll read till the end of the chapter, and then we'll come back. It says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. But let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the grounds of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in, in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of someone, for the sake of the one who informed you for the sake of conscience. I do not mean for your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thank thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that, for which I give thanks? So whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jew or the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. And then the first verse in chapter 11 says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's kind of where he wraps it up in verse 1 of the next chapter. But he spent three full chapters talking about not using your liberties, not abusing your things that you may be allowed to do. He's saying all things are lawful, but yet... They're not all helpful. So, so he's, I think it's, uh, it's important for us to take note of that, that he spends three full chapters in this book saying, you know what, you have been set free. If, you, if Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. And that is 100% true. But he's saying don't abuse it for the sake of your own wants and desires. Don't abuse it because you think you have liberty to do something that might offend a weaker brother or maybe or it might turn another, a non-believer away from following Christ. Your job, he's saying here, is to do all to the glory of God. Does it build up the brother or sister, or does it glorify God? He says, then do it. He goes, but instead of offending someone, like he said in the previous chapter, that he wouldn't even eat meat if it meant that somebody else would be offended by it and maybe cause them to not follow Christ. And here he's saying, all things are lawful, but they're not all helpful. And I think that's important for us to remember. Sometimes just because you're allowed to do something, just because there's something that you are technically is okay to do doesn't mean that it's good for you. It doesn't mean that it's going to help you. It doesn't mean that it's going to help build up a brother or sister because he's saying there's two very important things for us to keep in mind, that we build each other up and that we glorify God with what we do. And this, this verse, he says, not all things are helpful and not all things build up. And we have to keep that in mind when we're exercising our liberties. Sometimes we maybe think, well, but why should I not do something that I'm allowed to do? And sometimes there, there's a time and a place maybe for you to exercise these liberties, but it's important for you to note your, what your surroundings are. Like he's mentioning here, even in the verse, uh, well, there's a, it's a few verses further, I guess, where he's talking about if somebody m notices that this is meat that was sacrificed to idols, then stay away. So he is saying that there is a time and a place for you to exercise these things. If, if you're going and eating meat at a non-believer's house that has invited you for supper, you can go and you can thank God for the food and you can eat. But if somebody says, hey, did you not know? So then your liberty there is kind of a thing where 
it's not helpful anymore for you to exercise that liberty to be able to eat because somebody will be offended by it. You're going to cause a weaker brother or sister either to stumble or cause them to sin because uh, if you have the liberty to do something, whatever the case may be, and somebody else doesn't have that freedom yet, for them they're still viewing it as, as, a, as a violation against God. It's a sin and, and they're saying, oh, but I noticed Herman was doing it, so, so then it must be okay for me then I'll take part two, but my conscience still isn't allowing me to do it. Now I'm sinning against my own conscience because somebody else is doing it. And that's kind of what he's talking about here. You have to be careful with these things. Not all things are helpful and not all things build up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, this is a good chapter here. I, I, I think it is good, like you pointed out, that, that Paul did stress this and, uh, and stressed it because it was happening within the church. Remember the the letter to the Corinthians was written in answer to their questions, right? So they were questioning Paul about some of these things, like, like why should I be restricted by my fellow man's liberties? You know, why, why can't I just do what I want to do? Like, like, what's the purpose and reason why I should limit myself? And, and Paul very clearly says um, that we ought to seek the good of our neighbor. So, so it's, he, he says, as a Christian, our focus is not to just plow through this life, doing whatever we think is best for us. And we know in our day today, there, there's, there's Christians that go this direction, and we know that, uh, you, you, like you guys probably even know of people in your life who question any standard you might have. And they might say, uh, why do you do that? You know, you don't have to do that. I mean, we have liberty to do all these kinds of things. And, and, and so they'll participate in some really ungodly things. Like, like I know of believers who for some reason, have now thought that it's okay to, to, to use nasty language, like even, even curse words, and, and are now under the impression that, ah, I have the liberty, I, like, I'm not controlled by your convictions and those kinds of things, right? And so, so people will come against you for having a standard, um, and, and they will live their life, um, blatantly disregarding the conscience of other people, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's swearing, um, like all these kinds of things, people will say, well, who am I to, to be governed by your convictions? If I feel I have the liberty to do it, then I can. And Paul says, wait a minute, uh, even if you did have liberty, recognize that, that we're called in this life to build up our fellow believer. We're called in this life to not just live a life for ourselves, but to consider our neighbor and how is my actions going to affect them. Um, for example, uh, Brother John Bamman here shared with me sometimes that, that when he first became a believer, he, uh, he continued to smoke cigarettes and thought it was okay till one day someone came and approached him and said, you call yourself a Christian and you smoke cigarettes? And it gave John reason to, to consider um, what he was doing and recognize that some people did not have liberty. And, and even though I don't, th I don't think he looked at it as a liberty matter, but, but maybe didn't feel convicted yet at that point. But as soon as he heard that, he started to think, oh, well, my actions affect other people. Right, John? Yeah, amen. That's the day he quit smoking. And so I appreciate John often sharing from his life. Uh, we get to have that privilege often when we meet with him. Anyways, uh, just kind of thinking about that in, in this regard here, and, and then he gives an example, right? He, and he, he recognizes that these people were all familiar in the Corinthian church with this meat market. And, and so people would go buy meat at the market, and some of the meat would... Um, maybe not be sacrificed to idols. Maybe there was a section, maybe the higher price section was the meat that wasn't sacrificed to idols. Maybe that was the fresh meat or whatever. But there was a section that everybody knew that was meat sacrificed to idols. But maybe it was on discount, it was cheaper or something like that. And poorer people could afford to buy that kind of meat. And so, so Paul says, when you're going into somebody's house, um, don't even ask questions about where this meat came from. It doesn't matter, you know, that it was 
put on someone's altar. I mean, all things, like he says here, all things, um, the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. Um, so don't be so, so um, caught up in those things. Uh, so, so if somebody invites you to dinner, if an unbeliever even invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat what is set before you. You don't need to sit there and ask, oh, which table at the market did you buy this? Did you buy it at the, at the table that wasn't sacrificed to idols or, or did you buy it at the, at the discounted table where everybody knows that it was sacrificed to idols, right? And so he, he says, don't even, don't even raise a question. But maybe there's a third person that's invited to that dinner and they're sitting there and they're a new Christian and, uh, and they're looking at the meat and they're looking at the label on there and they're like, oh, I know that label and I know where it comes from. I know that comes from the table where the meat is sacrificed to idols. And I, I just can't believe that as Christian people we would, we would subject ourselves to eating from that kind of food. And so he says, for that person, consider um, for the sake of conscience. He says, I don't mean your conscience, I mean his his conscience. So he gives that thought there, which I think is good. Yeah, I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to note as well that Paul doesn't in any way say uh, for you to not use your freedoms. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say that you're mm -hmm. not allowed. What he's saying is with this freedom comes responsibility. You are not, um, you're not set free to run around and do as your heart desires. Your responsibility is to your fellow believer and your responsibility is also to glorify God with what you do. So there's always a few questions you have to ask yourself when you're doing something, when you're, when you're indulging in something that some may seem uh, or deem as being wrong or sinful, and if your conscience is saying, no, this is something that I'm free to do, there's two questions you have to ask. Is this edifying somebody? Is this building somebody up? And the other question is, does it glorify God when I'm doing this or when I'm eating this or partaking in this? And I think if we weigh our decisions uh, based on those, sometimes we would probably say, you know what, not today. Hmm. We're just going to leave it because it's not going to edify anybody and it's not going to glorify sure. God, right? So, yeah. so it's, he, Paul's not saying, mm -hmm. oh, you have all these freedoms and it's so great, but you can't use any of them. He's saying there's responsibility with these freedoms. You have to be careful how you use them so that you will do one of those two things, glorify God or build up a brother, right? So there's many things to consider when we're looking at these things. Um, when he says all things are lawful, he says, but will they lead to freedom from, sa uh, from slavery, to a sin or whatever? Are you going to be, uh, by exercising this freedom, is it going to set you free from an addiction or slavery to or in bondage or, of some sort? It's lawful, but it, will it make somebody else stumble if you do it? Hmm. If, if the answer is yes, then, then you need to reconsider. Will it build somebody up or will it tear them down? And then the, the other thing is, will it help to win somebody who is lost and without Christ? Will it help them to see that God is good and they want the salvation that you have? So you have to consider these things when you're weighing out what these freedoms look like in your lives. And if the answer is that this will not benefit anybody and it's not going to glorify God, or it's not going to be uh, showing somebody to the love of Christ in such a way that they're going to want what you have, then you need to reconsider why you're taking part in it, even though there is freedom and liberty to do so. Yeah, so if you look at verse 29, Paul, Paul anticipated the fact that with what he would say here, they would actually come back with a question. And, and so their question may have been, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Um, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So, so Paul likely anticipated this, and he puts this in there so that they would know that somebody who asked this question, I, I've, I've answered this in the thought that um, consider that not all things build people up. And so uh, one of the, th the thoughts maybe that we ought to consider here too is, is um, that, that we should balance Scripture with Scripture. So, for example, um, the thought, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Um, maybe 
maybe you feel like God has given you liberty in some areas, and there's maybe religious people in your life that are telling you, oh no, in order for you to be a devout follower of Jesus, this is what you have to wear. This is, this is what you have to do. Um, for example, some people might say, in order to be a devout Christian, you have to go to church on Sundays. Does going to church on Sundays demonstrate that you're a devout Christian? Does it? <laughs> Interesting thought, right? Um, there are many religious people that will never miss a Sunday. In fact, all of their life, they will never miss a Sunday morning service. Do they do it because of their faith in the Lord? Or do they do it because they want to make sure people are watching them? So, there's, so I'm not saying that going to church isn't important. I think it's very important. And I think as Christians, we ought to desire to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And, you know, we, we shouldn't be forced, though. We shouldn't be obligated. We shouldn't, we shouldn't think that I have to go to church. If I don't go to church, Christ will reject me. That's, that's not what church is. We go to church because we want to be there. We want to fellowship with God's people. We want to hear from the Word of God. We want to apply Scripture to our lives. We, we go there because we want to go there. And, and so some, somebody, though, might be in your life and might say, well, uh, you have to go to church. If you don't go to church, that means you're not going to be a Christian. So, so people might impose upon you religious duty. They might impose upon you a dress code. And they might say, when you go to church, this is how you ought to dress. And, and, and they might uh, make you feel like you ought to do everything the way they do it in order to be a more devout Christian. And so one of the things we need to consider is, is are the people in our life um, that are speaking into our life um, are they indeed a weaker brother? Or are they a religious person that's trying to impose their way of thinking upon our lives? Um, so somebody in your life who for 20 years has tried to impose their religion upon you, um, I don't believe at all that what Paul is saying here is that they're that weaker brother or sister that's stumbling. Keep in mind that a weaker brother or sister would be one who would be new in the faith, and, and would have uh, probably a, a background such as these people did, where they were probably scarred, they were probably really hurt, um, and maybe they were caught under the, the, the bondage of religion for many years. And so now they had finally come to freedom. And so there, there's a really delicate understanding there that you might trip up this person. This is not talking about the legalistic religious person that is trying to, to put heavy burdens upon you like the Pharisees did, that, that they can't even uh, adhere to themselves. And so Paul says here, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? He says, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which I give thanks? So, so the understanding is, consider those thoughts. Um, don't allow somebody's preferences uh, to weigh you down and burden you, but also consider very carefully that you ought not to um, trip up someone because you think you have the right to do whatever you want to do. So, I mean, all of Christian life is a balance, isn't it? It's, uh, it's something that we, we um, deal with on a regular basis. Yep, for sure. Um, if you're looking at verse 31 and 32, or part yeah, part of 33 too, I guess, it says, whatever you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there's, uh, again, what we were talking about before, that, that you're balancing out whether you're glorifying God or not by what you're doing. And then he says a few interesting things here in the next few verses. He says, give no offense to Jews, which are the religious group, mm -hmm. or to the Greeks, which are the unbelievers, or to the church, which actually are part of your family if you're a born-again believer. He says, just as I try to please everyone and everything I do. Does it sound to you like he's saying, I'm a people pleaser? Make sure you do whatever <laughs> so you fit in everywhere? Well, you could, you could look at it that way, right? You could. Mm -hmm. What do you think is, he's trying mm -hmm. to say here? Yeah, so um, one of the things we have to look at is that whole verse. 
So just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, and then notice this, not seeking my own advantage. Uh, a people pleaser is, is looking after who? Himself, right? When you're a people pleaser, you want, you want um, people to praise you, to say good things about you. You want to be well-liked so that, so that your popularity ratings go way up. And Paul makes it very clear. He says, I, I please everyone in everything I do, but not to my own advantage. It's not about me. It's not about the way I live my life. And I think, I think that's, <laughs> that goes far enough, right? Yep. Yeah, so he says, uh, that when you're thinking of that train of thought, he says to the Jews, he doesn't do it to the Jews. They're this religious group that he could very easily uh, turn off completely from listening to anything he has to say. If he says, your rules and your religion means nothing, I am free and I can go my own way, then they're going to say, this guy's lost and we have nothing more to do with him. But he's saying he doesn't offend them, he reasons with them. Yeah. He, he makes sure that he doesn't cause an offense there, that he doesn't have that open door of communication there. Same with a non-believer. If you're trying to get a non-believer to come to church, if you're trying to get a non-believer to, to accept Christ, and you're being uh, very difficult about it, about what, how, how they're going to hell, and you're on the, you're on the straight and narrow, and, and you're just kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe bad-mouthing what they're doing, you're saying you have to do what I do. He's saying he doesn't offend the non-believer or the religious group, and he's very careful. He also mentions, or to the church of God. He doesn't compromise when it comes to the religious group. He doesn't compromise when it comes to non-believers. And he makes sure that within the church setting, he doesn't offend another believer. Mm -hmm. So he, that's why he's saying, I please people. He's not saying I'm a people pleaser, but he wants to make sure that he has that open door of communication that he can actually minister to them and not close those doors just because he's taking advantage of his own liberties. And like you're saying, not to his own advantage. I think that's a very yeah. important key in that whole train of thought there because a people pleaser does 100% everything that will benefit him or her. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, it doesn't work out because you have so many different groups of people and you're fitting in everywhere. And then soon you forget which one you're, who, who, who's actually really you, right? You're kind of, you're mm -hmm. running yourself in circles and it doesn't benefit you anymore because at the end of the road, uh, there's destruction there because you have no idea anymore what, like where you're up to. Paul is saying he doesn't worry about any of those things. He's true to God. He says, he says, not to my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Amen. Yeah, that, that, that's his motivation. Like, if you think if you, you look at his thought here, his, his motivation is that people would be saved. You, um, if we were looking from the outside in, you might look at the Apostle Paul and say, what a hypocrite. And, and people... People around us today don't understand this thought. <clears throat> For example, what if you and I went to the country of Iran and we know that Iran is predominantly Muslim and uh, like say for you as a, as a woman, um, you went there to go and share the gospel with Iranian women and you would come in there make, with your, your hair styled and, and wearing shorts and a blouse or something and and, you know, maybe, maybe to you, you felt like you were pretty modest. But in that culture, uh, the, the woman there must wear a head covering, and they must not show skin. And so, I think, besides their face. And so, for you to go into a culture like that, you might really, really, really consider how you're going to dress. Because you know that by you taking your liberty into a culture like that, you may not have be of any value to those people over there. In fact, anybody that sees you may, may actually give you a 20-foot berth and make sure they don't come near you. Your, your, your witness may not be very advantageous to you b because of what you are wearing, which, which, which is interesting, right? For, in, for example, too, if, um, like I, I think I shared this with you last time already, if I went to certain um, Mennonite colonies in Mexico, and I might have the liberty here in Canada to wear shorts and a t-shirt. Well, if I go into some of those colonies wearing shorts and a t-shirt and knock on doors, nobody might open the door to me. I might, I might destroy any witness that I, that I would have possibly had. And so, to the outsider, 
me going to, to Mexico and dressing differently than I do here in Canada might look like hypocrisy, right? Like, why is he doing that there and not here? Well, people could have accused the Apostle Paul of that too. Because to the Jew, he became as a Jew. You know, what did that mean? You know, did it mean his style? Did it mean the way he ate food? Like, probably a number of different things. He probably denied himself certain things when he ministered to the Jewish people. He probably denied himself certain things when he went and ministered to the Gentile or the Greeks. And so, it wasn't hypocrisy. I mean, hypocrisy is an issue of the heart. And Paul is saying here, no, that's, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not that kind of a, a people pleaser. What I'm trying to do is I'm motivated by saving souls. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to not throw off people, to not, to not in any way um, prevent people from hearing the gospel. He says, my desire is that they would be saved. And then he says to you guys, and he says to all of us, be an imitator of me. <laughs> what, Paul? Be hypocrite like you? No, that's not what he's saying. He says, be an imitator of me just as I am of Christ. Wow. Inspired words of God. Yeah, and if you look mm -hmm. at that for a second, he says, uh, be an imitator as he is of Christ. And if you look at the, the life of Christ, when he was ministering to um, Pharisees or Sadducees or the woman at the well, or the beggar that comes to him, or the people that are asking for him to heal their, their blindness, or, or the lepers, he approaches them very differently mm. because of who they are and what their background is. He doesn't approach everybody with the same uh, uh, approach either. And that's kind of what Paul is saying. Look at what the biggest benefit will be to people. He's saying you have liberty, you have freedom. That freedom comes from the blood of Christ that bought that for you. Mm -hmm. He says, so balance these things out with knowledge of your freedom and with the love of people so that you can do it not just for your own benefit, your own gain, but so that people may see and hear who God is through your life and how you interact with people. Amen. Amen. Should we close in prayer yet? Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the many blessings in our life. In this scripture passage, Lord, um, very meaningful to us. We can apply it to, to numerous areas in our, in our own lives. Lord, I am especially caught up in the thought tonight where Paul said, be an imitator of me, just as he was of Jesus Christ. Father, we long to be more like Jesus. Give us hearts that are conformed to the image of Christ. Father, may we, may we understand that even though all things may be lawful, not all things build up our fellow man, Lord. May we understand that whatever we do, we ought to do to the glory of God. <clears throat> so, Lord, give us wisdom, Lord. Help us to apply truths to our lives, these truths, Lord, these principles, this doctrine, Lord. May we apply it to our lives and become better people, Lord. Um, beyond that, Lord, may we become more like Jesus, like Paul was saying, an imitator of Christ. Lord, help us to be that. Help our hearts to be so in line with you that the world would see Jesus in us, Lord. Father, that, uh, that our testimony and our witness would point people to Christ. Father, give us wisdom to make the proper decisions in our life, to go in the right direction, that you would be exalted and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.